All right. Well, hi, everybody. It's noon on Wednesday, and that means it's time for our Wednesday webinar from One Schoolhouse. And I'm delighted today to welcome Amy Howard for a repeat from her very popular webinar with us this last fall. So, Amy, I think we've agreed that we're going to have you a couple times a year, for a couple of times a year for sure. I just want to remind everybody that a little bit going on at One Schoolhouse blog today. We've got a post that was inspired by the conversation that I had with Emmy when we were preparing for this. So um, thank you for that. And then next week's webinar, we have Tim Fish from NAIS joining us about the next normal. And then on our website, we have done some refreshing and revising. So I welcome all of you to come to the Independent Curriculum website, independentcurriculum.org, and download your copy of the newly revised and expanded principles and standards for independent curriculum development. And we also have summer professional development that goes along with that. And then we've got on the, if you click on the professional development tab on our website, you'll see that we have courses reflect, restore and renew for independent school teachers and leaders. And I describe this as sort of the day after the marathon, you want to take the restorative yoga class and really um, build to a new strength, not just go back to how you were before then. And then we're also bringing back Building Trust, which is one of our most popular courses for academic leaders on how to engage with your faculty and build more professional trusting relationships after challenges. So with all that being said, I want to welcome Peter and Emmy. And again, I'm Sarah Hannah and here at One Schoolhouse. And Peter, do you want to say hello and just introduce yourself and then we'll get started. Today. Sure. I'm Peter Gow. I'm the Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse. And uh, for the moment, I'm also working as a remote uh, independent school based college counselor. So this is all very relevant to my work in all kinds of ways. I think we have some sound interference on yours. On your end. There might be something on your um, over your speaker or something. Oh. Emmy, welcome. Emmy is the executive director of the Independent School College Counseling Association. And I would love, Emmy, for you to just tell everybody a little bit about you and your work before we begin. Sure. Uh, as, as Sarah said, thank you uh, for having me. First of all, I'm Emmy Harward. I get to serve as executive director of AXIS, the Association of College Counseling, College Counselors in Independent Schools. Um, that's a role that I've been in full time for just over four years, having spent 15 years in two different independent schools in college counseling offices uh, and several years in college admissions prior to that. And AXIS's mission is to support our members as the school leaders that uh, that they are in uh, in advancing um, the the roles that they play within the life of a school um, within the professional larger professional world that, that we uh, that we work in and occupy and I'm uh, pleased to see several uh, familiar names of our of our membership in the in the attendees. Great, thank you. Well, last fall when we met, um, there were a lot of things that were really unclear on the whole college application and admissions front. And before we get into the details about what clarity has emerged, can you talk a little bit about how academic leaders can support college counselors? Sure. Um, one thing I think that's that's changed, I realize as I as I look at myself, um, is that I'm wearing my reading glasses all the time now. So I'd say any schools that opened up uh, your vision plan for early open enrollment um, probably are being appreciated by your faculty and staff right now. But on on a serious note, I think I think what I said in the fall um, was you know asking school leaders to have their college counselors backs. Um, I think I'll now shift to standing beside them or even out in front of them um, at, at this point. Uh, I realize every school employee probably needs that kind of support right now. Um, so let's just make it easy and we'll add college counseling team to, to that list. Um, <clears throat> the, the impact of 
<clears throat> on um, mental health and morale for students is something that I that I know that we're we're looking at very clearly. Um, we certainly need to look at that for faculty and staff and, and college counselors are no different in that in that regard. Um, you know, I I, I want to reinforce that the college counseling process and the college admission process um, typically makes changes on an annual or slower basis. And, and this year, it has really been much more moment to moment, uh, email to email basis for, for a lot of institutions throughout the fall and winter. And so the, the college counselors really across the, the country and, and school-based counselors are doing um, the best that they can, offering counsel based on the information they have at, at that particular moment in time. And then when uh, when a college or an institution does uh, does a fast and unexpected 180, it's it's the college counselor who the the caregivers and, and students will often uh, look to um, for blame for not having the accurate information when in fact the information is what has changed. And Peter, you're living in that role right now as well. Sure. Well, I, I think you know, what Emmy said, I was on a call in the other day with a group of uh, college admission directors, and one of them used the term the fog of this year, which I think is exactly right. We are all living in a fog, and you never know what is it is two feet in front of you. Um, I think what's also important for the for academic leaders to think about as they stand by and perhaps in front of their college counselors is that this is a process that's being conducted by people of goodwill. These are people trying their very best to do the right thing and do the thing that's going to work for their students and for their institutions in a world in which nothing seems quite as certain um, as we all hoped it would by now. And I think that's something that's really important. So, yeah, think of that goodwill thing. The other thing, I think this is a, an opportunity for academic leaders to be in conversation with their college offices about what, what the college folks are seeing in these changes. Um, the landscape of expectations may be changing in a lot of ways. Um, standardized testing appears no longer to be in its ascendancy. Uh, so there may be opportunities to reshape even some of the basics of the core curriculum to take advantage of some of the new and more learner-focused ideas about curriculum and assessment that have been floating around for 20 years. And we would very much like to bring into our classrooms and into our curricula. So this is a, an opportunity there, but it's about remembering this is about people of goodwill. Thank you. That is. That's a good reminder as we begin. So we've talked about that things are changing and that there is uncertainty, but there are places where there is some clarity now that we didn't have. Before. Amy, can you tell us a little bit about what maybe has emerged? Sure, and even, even just this week, um, uh, an um, article came out as, as new information was released uh, through Common App um, that the increase in students who applied test optional or test free to college um, it increased dramatically, as was expected, because the vast majority of colleges ceased requiring a test that was going to literally require students to take their life in their hands in order to sit for. So the, um, the, the numbers that were released by common application, and um, I can drop a link to one article in the chat, I think. Um, but Common App released that um, it went from about 77% of um, applications submitted, not applicants, who, uh, who had submitted a test score last year to 44% of, of students. Um, I would hazard a guess that the majority of that 44% were students in much more privileged situations like those in our schools who um, had the advantage of their school potentially being able to offer some type of in-person instruction, being able to pivot to offer a school day SAT at some point, either last spring or this fall, um, 
or students who had the ability to be able to fly somewhere um, outside of their own area to be able to sit for a test. Um, but the positive on that, I think, and, and it is a positive, is I think test optional may be uh, and test, test free, um, which many are using in lieu of test blind because of the ableist language in, in endemic in that. But I think test optional may, may be here uh, to stay at the majority of institutions. I think the most highly selective uh, are going to go back to it, if for no other reason than to add a barrier to control the, the numbers of applicants to their pools, unfortunately. But I, I think while it was the pandemic that, that caused this, I think it is also um, pushing in large numbers rather than anyone going out on their own of institutions to, to look at who they were excluding from strong consideration in their applicant pools. Uh, students who really in all other measures uh, and would be amazing contributors to an academic institution. Uh, who they were excluding by, by requiring these test scores that in, in and of themselves have um, some pretty significant uh, flaws in, in who they are designed for and what they're designed to do. Um, so I, I would say the testing is is a, a huge piece where some clarity has occurred. The other thing we've seen now, and this has changed dramatically from November to January to, to the past few days, and I can put another story in. Um, I, I relied on Inside Higher Ed for this too much, so I would say any of you who don't uh, subscribe already to the Inside Higher Ed online um, daily email, um, uh, little blurb that that goes out if you have any interest in just kind of having a vague sense they do a monday admissions insider uh, if you have any interest in keeping an eye on on some of the things that your college counselors are are reading uh that that could be a good insight um one of the other things that's that's occurred recently is um what hits major media are um stories like harvard having an increase of 42 percent of their applications university of virginia 15 percent the university of california system having these huge increases um colgate had an 102 percent increase which which still boggles the mind in all sorts of ways um but they were colgate was the outlier um it was typically the most selective and colgate is certainly highly selective but the most selective and larger institutions had these huge double digit increases the majority of institutions smaller and regional institutions did not see those huge increases. Um, I would argue that the, the colleges and universities to which most independent school students apply um, are, are in the categories that saw these huge increases, which means not only is it going to be more selective, there's gonna be more waitlist activity, it's going to be difficult to predict who is going to get in and who is not. Um, and that's that's really been a, a roller coaster since the fall of at the point of early decision and early action for a lot of institutions um, prior to November 1 uh, and, and soon after, it looked like application numbers were down a lot of places. Um, and then we saw these huge increases come through. So um, a lot of that I'm sure is, is due to the fact that, um, that having a test score um, that was out of range was seen as a barrier. International applications at a lot of places went way up, which is certainly indicative of how difficult it was for international students to sit for some of these standardized tests in the first place, uh, even even get to a location where they were being offered. But uh, but again, while there's clarity in the numbers, uh, the lack of clarity is certainly what um, what we're going to continue to see in how decisions pan out with those really unpredictably uh, large applicant pools. I think there'll likely be more waitlist activity. Uh, I think. There may be some colleges that reopen their applications uh, for uh, just new new inquiries from from students who may not be pleased with the options that they have, and um, it, it, I think it's going to be a long spring. So you um, actually already started answering my next question, which is about Sorry. murkier. No, no, no. It's, I mean. I think this idea of if the numbers are up this much and the numbers for any particular child might be up everywhere that they are applying. So our definition of likely schools or reach schools, that gets really murky as well, doesn't it? it it's, um, yes, and, and I say this again, seeing some familiar names um, in in the, the attendee list who, who are feeling this much more acutely than, than I am. Uh, sitting in my office, but the the ability to predict without 
a test score when all the past indications included a test score and layered on to that when um, the past included uh, a more predictably sized applicant pool. Any, any kind of jump like that, you don't know where those students are coming from. And so colleges don't know how many students they need to admit in order to uh, secure the class of the size that they want. Uh, they often don't know how much uh, money in uh, need or merit-based financial aid they need to offer to secure that class and what other institutions will be doing. The um, need-based financial aid applications uh, have started for the past several years going on what's known as a prior prior year calculation. So it's not going on 2020 taxes, it's going on 2019. And for families who were really significantly impacted by, um, by the pandemic in, in financial ways, um, whether it was you know their own finances or, or through a business, the, the need to uh, appeal a financial aid decision or apply for professional judgment consideration is going to increase, uh, which again is, is going to be an, another unknown. Uh, there may be factors that family that 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 befell families um, after the student applied uh, that that were not in consideration when when the application list was complete. So the the murkiness i think is just kind of the ongoing um the ongoing question and now especially that college counselors are knee deep in working with juniors and often younger younger students um you know talking to a junior or a sophomore about standardized testing not knowing if that's going to be required and in many areas of the country like where i am in southern california um that ability to sit for a standardized test has not changed since last spring so so whether or not a student will need uh, a test score for a college or not, um, that is still up in the air. Um, and then you talk about, you know, building a course schedule for a rising junior or senior and what is that going to look like and, and are we going to be in a position to uh, to challenge students. Um, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to learning loss, but I think acquisition, maybe the, the ability for teachers to be able to um, support students in in their learning. Uh, especially in a hybrid environment, uh, let alone in a remote environment. Uh, so building those course schedules, uh, looking at curriculum overall. Anyway, I think I think there's there's a long list of things that are still that are still murky that are that are very whole school. Um, but but I I do think that the 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 drawn out process through the spring um, of um, admission decisions for regular decision applications continuing to roll out between now and likely the middle of April this year when normally those had all been received around April 1. Um, I, I think it's going to um, it, it's going to be a, a challenge and again it, it's going to be that way all around there's colleges probably colleges wouldn't have been able to predict some of the decisions coming out of their offices uh, six months ago and so college counselors certainly can't be expected to. So, Peter, can you talk a little bit, too, about students who are younger and how schools are balancing their needs and helping them determine their coursework, which is usually, you know, sort of a fraught conversation at any point, particularly this time of year when I know that some students are like, well, I'm ready to think about next year's courses. I know I still have a couple of months to go, but this year, maybe more so than ever, kids feel like, Ugh, can I be done with this year and think about next year? I, I see a lot of that going on at the school where I am helping out. And I think the other thing that we need to be aware of with juniors, and we don't know yet unless it's come out in the last 24 hours, whether the Common App is gonna be continuing its COVID questions. Uh, this year, students were invited to uh, write about how they had experienced the pandemic Schools were invited in the counselor, uh, overall counselor profile to uh, provide some information on how the school had been dealing with this. Um, we hope those kinds of continue, those kinds of questions will continue to be there for kids. Maybe Emmy knows more on this than I do. Uh, but the, uh, um, you know, part of the work right now with juniors is beginning to figure out how to help them shape how they're going to tell the, the, the most deeply personal part of their stories. That's the part that, you know, that's the essay, uh, but it's also part of the journey in finding their, you know, what their criteria are for, for choosing schools to even apply to. And that work of helping kids do that 
is going to be compounded, I think, by our need as counselors to help kids figure out how to tell their personal stories of the pandemic experience because the differential experience of kids is just, it, the, the range is unbelievable. The range of kids is always unbelievable, but this year has just extended the range uh, a thousand miles in either direction if you look at it as a graph. And how we're gonna support these kids and how we support them now as they are being invited to, let's start talking about you know, what your college search, apply, choose process is going to be like. Um, it's really a challenge for kids. And, you know, just thinking about next year's courses, you're, you're right, Sarah, that they don't want to do that right now for the most part. Um, they'd like to think about next week's possibility of taking a distance walk with a friend. So we had a question come in, and I just want to remind everybody, if you will, use the Q&A for questions. But Emmy, this is a good one, and it touches on something you and I spoke about last week, too, which is kids in sports. And is there are there implications for kids who want to play a sport at the collegiate level with maybe a backlog of students and redshirting and, and all of that? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we we kind of expected this. This was going to be um, one of the one of the next things that we addressed, and it's um, it's it's challenging right now um, in in a lot of ways because um, for many coaches, because of the uncertainty of last season, let alone this season, um, the NCAA extent for at least Division One, Division Two, um, extended eligibility by a year for spring athletes last year. Um, so a lot of teams. Uh, this year have uh, an extra group of athletes that are that are hanging out with them, which means for students who were were um, 2020 graduates of independent schools of all schools, um, th there may have been again that backlog. There are a lot of institutions that are not competing this year on the college side, um, and so for a number of reasons, either students chose to um, freshman athletes or or potentially in, in any at any grade level chose to redshirt to kind of take a, a year off of um off of their playing time um, but maintain their scholarship um and then there were the not insignificant number of um 2020 high school graduates who chose to defer their admission for a year and and take a, a gap year doing whatever it was that you do in a pandemic and um and for those who were student athletes that means that that's a spot um that is overlapping with the 2021 graduates of, of this current senior class um, and how, how that's running. And it reminded me, this is a very dated reference, but it reminded me of um, almost 20 years ago when the province of Ontario in Canada that had held a grade 13 um, forever eliminated their grade 13 uh, and graduated basically a double cohort of grade 12 and 13 students in the same year. And so the universities were, were flooded. Um, I don't know why that has stuck in my mind for so long, um, never having lived close to the Canadian border, um, but but there is almost this um, this double cohort in some ways of of student athletes, and so as a result, um, I have heard anecdotally of coaches asking a student, a, a current 2021 student, if they'd be willing to reclassify to 2022, um, which is easy for a coach to say. Um, but for a student, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You know, are they are they saying take a gap year? Are they saying take a PG year? Are they saying just do something and go and and you know stay stay in shape for the next year and and come and see me? Is that a guaranteed spot? Is it not? Um, again, I I think the majority of student athletes at independent schools are in really privileged positions to be able to play some pretty privileged sports in some cases. Um, but but for some students, this is really the the um, financial opportunity that they may have to be able to attend a four year for your institution. And so it's been it's been challenging because, again, that's a rule book that kind of um, was was rewritten because of the pandemic as well. Thank you. So another question that's come in, I'm just going to remind everybody if you use the Q&A, I have a better shot of making sure I see the question, um, which is, could you elaborate on what you mentioned earlier about schools reopening their admissions window? I think um, the person thinks that's yeah, right. this is this is me projecting 100%. I've seen nothing that um, that says that this that this will happen. However, um, I think for some of the institutions that saw their application numbers decrease 
um, and again, still have no idea of yield. If, if you have institutions that had 40 some percent increases in applications, you're going to have significantly more of those applicants who don't gain admission than do. I think that's intuitive. Um, I think it is likely that students um, who, who aimed really high and applied to uh, only institutions that had these huge increases um, may see themselves um, without the options that they had hoped for and may be more interested in applying other places. And so I am uh, predicting, projecting, uh, based on no information, uh, the possibility that there may be some of the less selective institutions who all of a sudden are looking at numbers coming in and realizing that they are not likely to make the target enrollment for their entering class, um, who, who may choose to um, take late applications again. And, and this has always been the case. I, I think, again, because of the position we're in, in independent schools, most people feel like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford are the way that everyone does admission. Um, most admissions is rolling. Um, most admission is not highly selective. Um, most inst four-year institutions admit more than 50% of the students who apply. Um, so I'm not talking about Stanford reopening their application to be able to take more. Um, they, they could enroll a, a statistically identical class several times over based on the pool they already have. I'm talking about some of the smaller, uh, less selective liberal arts colleges, some of the um, more regional institutions may end up having spaces later on. Um, which has always been the case. I, I just, I think there may be more of them and we may hear more about it in the spring. Well, and I think that's a real opportunity too for academic leaders to demonstrate their partnership with their college counselors, right? On, you know, this is something that we, we have prepared you to thrive in, in the college that you go to. And so that may not be the one that you thought or early this year is so strange, but you are ready to become the person that you are meant to be and you will thrive. You know, along those lines, and I don't know that this is necessarily a, a good thing or, or a place where it's it's hitting students that they are going to thrive is anecdotally, I've also heard from, from a decent number of counselors um, hearing an increase from students, especially freshmen and sophomores. Um, in college, uh, an increase in requests to have uh, transcripts sent off to different institutions for transfer applications. Um, and, and I think some of that is, uh, is a grass is greener kind of desire of, um, you know, I don't like sitting behind a screen or being quarantined in my dorm room. Um, it, it must be better somewhere else, um, not necessarily realizing the, the bigger picture that um, every institution is dealing with this in, in a variety of ways and it's challenging globally. So, um, and again, an institution that may be 100% in person has its own set of challenges. Uh, so I, I think um, I, I think it's it's just, again, it's a tough time all around. And I've, I've heard some college counselors checking in more with their 2020 grads and even all of their um, current college students just, just to have some kind of, um, you know, some kind of anchor for them. Ironically, two kids could switch schools and both be certain that, the, yes, it, I was right, it's much better here. Well, and it's like, yes, you were right, because the 21-22 school year is going to be better than the 2021. Anyway, I may be mixing up my numbers there, but. <laughs> and the other thing for the juniors is sometimes juniors want to get in touch with kids who are at some of the schools that their college counselors have talked to them about. Uh, right now, unless it's a graduate from the class of 2018 or before, uh, you're looking at students who have not had a full year of a sort of traditionally normal college experience. So. That's true. And the idea that we're going into our second um, very unusual spring, not our first, as Emmy mentioned with the sports as well. So we're getting up on the end. So before I close everything off, though, if anybody has a last question, we'd welcome that. And Amy and Peter, do you have any final words of wisdom? I'll I'll offer one one thing, and I I remember every year uh, when I was in in schools um, how uh, refreshing, for lack of a better word, it was to um, to begin working with juniors in the spring uh, to talk about 
colleges because it was just uh, a refresh and a reset on um, what had really gone into the nitty gritty phase with seniors in applying to colleges. It was check your portal, make sure your scores have been sent, uh, complete your financial aid applications. Um, with juniors, it's a chance to open things up again and start to talk about the things that we enjoy about working with students uh, to talk about uh, their goals and aspirations and what makes them tick and why they enjoy the school where we are, um, what it is that they're hopeful for, some of the, the fun family stories uh, that, that you often will hear from caregivers uh, about um, student experiences, that type of thing. Um, it's harder to do that virtually, no question. Um, it's harder to do that uh, even at a distance in person, masked, but um, that's that's the piece that I think um, that I think is is really um, uh, rejuvenating for for a lot of college counselors is being able to get back into the this is why we enjoy this part um, and I think college counselors are having to focus on the student centered piece of of the work um, so much more because everything else is is changing and in chaos and, and less predictable but focusing on the student experience which most college counselors do and thrive on. Um, no one, no one loves working in no, no college counselors love working um, solely with with spreadsheets and deadlines. So, um, so I do enjoy that. And I think from a whole school standpoint, um, you know, this, this is a time to remember that um, if we're not looking at mission and values as a whole school and every aspect of the school, um, it's, it's going to come back on us. Uh, any institution that is marketing their educational experience based on an external outcome over which you have no control, um, you know, using college admission results in the marketing of, of the school is, uh, doesn't say a whole lot positive about your school. And, and so if you keep the focus on the educational experience, the rest of it is going to take care of itself. You don't need to uh, use a few well-chosen, highly selective colleges uh, as expectations when, when, again, the experience is the thing that you're hoping to bring, bring folks in for. Uh, most of our institutional missions talk about being uh, college preparatory, for example, um, but, but very few of them uh, talk about, um, you know, the, the, the college outcome expectation, and, and that's for good reason. Thank you. Uh, it's inspiration to hear that too. And then we have one question and I'm going to call it after this because I do like to end on time or close to it. But um, Peter and Emmy, would you speculate on the future of AP courses testing and college credit? And Peter, I'll just say hi to I'll just say hi to Susan Tree and then I'll let Peter take it away. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Emmy. Uh, and hi, Susan. Um, I think the future of the AP program is very much in the hands of the College Board right now. Last year's uh, sort of suddenly changed testing program did not work out terribly well for a lot of kids in all kinds of schools across the country. And if they repeat that this year, I think they are going to put themselves in serious jeopardy. I think we've also seen, it's no secret that uh, we've seen a great increase in the interest in independent schools in particular in sort of creating their own mission aligned uh, teacher created courses really focused on their own missions and their own students experiences. Those things are not going to change very much I think in independent schools that that trend is growing uh, I think quite rapidly. And so what happens with those courses and what happens with whether colleges are going to be, right now colleges, you know, the colleges that offer some kind of a benefit based on an advanced placement test score, because that's where the, uh, the benefit comes from, those colleges may begin looking at other metrics to uh, give students those same kinds of upgrades or whatever they might be. So I think the College Board has a lot of work to do. They're an incredible engine of opportunity. Uh, and if the whole promise were really fully kept, and I know they try hard, um, the Advanced Placement Program would be an amazing, can be and is an amazing thing for many, many students. Uh, but it's not the only option 
that schools and students have looking at them right now. Uh, so that, that's the best answer I can give. Amy may have further thoughts. No, I would say that's another piece of support that school leaders can offer is if you if you had someone in, in your school um, and, and likely in the college counseling office who was supporting, um, you know, administration of standardized testing, whether it was through AP or SAT or PSAT, ACT, um, that that job has just been untenable this year and and AP has been made even more challenging for this spring. Um, where last year it was all um, all digital and had its own level of challenge. Um, this year there will be both digital and paper and pencil options, um, but through four different administration windows, two of which um, are after many schools graduate. Um, so the 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 um, level of support I think that schools are going to need as families. Um, try to pick at schools for implementing someone else's policies over which they have no control um, are, are challenging. And as, as Peter said, um, you know, ind independent schools are, it's, it's in your name, it's in our names. Independent schools are, are so well suited to be able to self uh, determine and, and develop challenging coursework uh, of, of our own. Um, so many of our independent school teaching faculty are on the committees that have helped write some AP curriculum. Um, so if, um, if that isn't the opportunity to, um, to do some more self-determination on this, I, I don't know. I don't know what is. That is the exact way to put it. So thank you both so much. I hope everybody has a good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us and we'll be back here next week. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you. Thanks, Emmy.